inviting us to speak today, Oak Street, Early Paths to the American Dream, The Essential Role of Property in Life, Liberty and the Pursuit of Happiness, The Big Role of a Small Street in Rhinebeck, New York. I'm Bill Jeffway, the Executive Director of the Dutchess County Historical Society. I'm sharing work today done in partnership with Melody Moore, who's the County Historical Society's Chair of Collections and a partner in program and interpretation at the Historical Society with me. Melody and I started investigating Oak Street well over a year ago, not entirely sure what we might discover. There was some understanding that Oak Street had been home to many persons of color over many years and may have been one of a number of free black communities that sprung up, most of them temporarily just prior to the Civil War. Inspired to some degree by the work we'd done examining the transient free black community of New Guinea in Hyde Park, Kathy Hammer of Rhinebeck's Historical and Archaeological Preservation Advisory Committee suggested we examine the well-preserved homes of 19th century working class Rhinebeck along Oak Street to see what stories emerge. We received the support of the town of Rhinebeck and village of Rhinebeck, which led to this work By widening the lens to an equal length of adjacent West Market Street, we're afforded some benchmarks that help put Oak Street in context. We've worked with Henry Frischknecht's seventh grade class for a few years in different ways and are pleased to say that this partnership continues with his civics class, as you will see, involving Oak Street. We will be featuring an introduction to what we hope will become a permanent online exhibition of student work that allows the study and enjoyment of Oak Street to continue to evolve over time. We're grateful to the Rhinebeck Historical Society, who's invited us to take pride of place in their regular monthly program lineup. This program will be archived at both Rhinebeck and the County Historical Societies. To speak about Oak Street as a path to the American dream, suggests we should refresh our memory about how the American dream was articulated in our founding documents. Very relevant to the Oak Street discussion is the principle articulated by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence, that we are all endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson did not deny that he was taking inspiration from John Locke, the English philosopher who wrote a century earlier, expressing thoughts that became principles of what was called the Enlightenment, a period of more rational, hopeful thinking. Jefferson made an adjustment to Locke's words, however, that stood out to some. Locke wrote 100 years before Jefferson that among the inalienable rights of man are life, liberty, and property. Whether Jefferson used the word or not, there's no doubt in any of the founders' mind that access to property was a key to civic engagement and a key to economic political and social advancement. After all, since the 17th century and the colonial period in New York, voting rights depended not only on property ownership, but a certain minimum value of property ownership. So as you'll see later, this change in wording became political fodder for those arguing they were being blocked out of property ownership. But there was no doubt that property was seen as central to making economic political, and social progress. Oak Street property was valuable because of its strategic location. It's located just 500 feet west of the village center on the way to Rhinecliff Landing. The massive economy of the Empire State grew out of and along the landings at the Hudson, like Rhinecliff, where inland farmers traded agricultural goods for cash or manufactured goods, and ships accessed the Atlantic Ocean to the south, and accessed the North American continent via the Mohawk River and Erie Canal to the north. Howard Morse, the local historian, wrote in 1908 that Oak Street was like, quote, the old village beehive, and he meant this in the most flattering way. Here were the earnest laborers who at the time would have been generally called mechanics, carriage makers, shoemakers, hat makers, tinsmiths, blacksmiths, and so on. The hard part comes here the idea that all are created equal, with the implication that all should have equal access and equal protection under the law, this was a radical, uniquely American experiment, and it was an aspirational goal in 1776. 
All the powers of Europe were and would remain monarchies until World War I in the early 20th century. Protestant England and Catholic France set the dynamics of that conflict in the New World. In colonial New York in 1701, voting laws were changed to declare that, quote, no papist, in other words, no Catholic, could vote unless they swore oaths that would have been contrary to their Catholic beliefs. When it came to voting, the exclusion of those without property, the exclusion of the enslaved, Jews, Catholics, and women, kept political power within a narrower band that is enjoyed today. On the surface in 1820, things seemed great, was called at the time, and referred to by historians today as the era of good feelings. In 1820, James Monroe won the presidency unopposed, getting all but one of the electoral college because of a rogue individual elector. If we look just at Rhinebeck voters, when they went to the polls in 1822, in Rhinebeck, the vote for governor was 425 to 4. No cliffhanger there. The vote for state senator was 413 to 4. The vote for congressman was 376 to 37, so that was a little tighter. But 50 years later, the United States had gone through what remains its deadliest war, where 2% of the U.S. population died, the equivalent of 7 million people today. How could we get from an era of good feeling to such a deadly conflict in not much more than a generation? The answer lies in what you will see here on Oak Street. More and more people were seeking an equal seat at an increasingly diverse American table. And this was a process of accommodation, of letting their voices be heard and having their issues addressed. You can actually see this point being made in the local newspaper in 1822. We see that the author is suggesting that's only one-eighth of the United States population that is in such a secure and happy situation. The population of the United States was around 9 million people at the time. They're no doubt referring to the exclusion of enslaved, of women, of Catholics and Jews, and poor white working class. As the United States was opening up to more people, those various voices wanted to be heard, and those voices can be heard on Oak Street. Let's look at what four groups in particular were up against and how Oak Street helped them advance the first purchases of land in the 1830s were those of African heritage and descent, most likely former slaves. Also, a good number of the new owners were women, apparently single or widowed women. Persons of color found a constant alternating of advances and setbacks in this period. Although the 1827 abolition of slavery in New York State was nearing, in 1821, New York State changed its constitution such that white men were free of a property requirement to vote, but that property ownership with a value of at least $250 free and clear was established for blacks only. In 1850, the Fugitive Slave Law deepened the division, a division described as a house divided by the 1858 U.S. Illinois Senate candidate Abraham Lincoln. He famously said that a house divided cannot stand, and that the U.S. had to become all slave or all free, but could not remain split in this way. It took the Civil War, of course, to resolve this division. Of all these groups, women had one of the earliest victories in 1848 relating to property ownership, but had to wait the longest to earn the right to vote, which was gained nationally in 1920. In 1848, in what was seen by women at the time as the first legal win in what turned out to be a very long battle, New York State changed property laws to allow women to own property and earn income and keep it. Prior to this, property and income reverted to the husband and out of control of the woman. When the landmark Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention was held a few months later, the change in law was heralded as a positive first step. The second wave of Oak Street settlers were Irish Catholics who arrived when the need for railroad construction workers emerged in 1850. The United States had long accommodated Irish immigrants, but they were for the most part Protestant and wealthy, 
The Catholics arriving faced suspicion and prejudice, and in the 1840s, the Know-Nothing Party emerged, eventually becoming the American Party, distinguishing itself as standing up for those who were native-born whites, who felt they were suffering from the large scale of immigration of working-class Irish Catholics. The white Protestant impoverished working class organized themselves around what they called the mechanics political movement, with mechanics referring generally to shoemakers, carriage makers, blacksmiths, and so on. They advocated for the end of imprisonment for debt, which occurred in 1833, and they made property ownership a top priority and argued early on that each man should get the same amount of property at birth and not be able to leave anything to future generations. A Dutchess County political leader described themselves as 7,000 landless slaves, making the point that they could not afford to purchase property. One of the most visible leaders of that political movement was born in Rhinebeck in poverty, and through military service and military bonus property in Louisiana. This house painter moved up the ladder, building the house on nearby West Market Street that stands as testimony to his success today. All these amazing stories of hope and ambition all played out on a 1,000-foot stretch of Oak Street in a half century. Before we dive into Oak Street specifically, one more comment. Always with history, we have to be conscious about whose voice we're listening to. The old adage that history is written by the victors suggests that there's only one voice or one history. That's how you end up with a description like the era of good feelings that did not reflect the feelings of the entire population. I don't mean to pick on Ambrose Wager, whose beautiful Second Empire home stands at the base of Oak Street. I use the image of the house symbolically to say that these are the voices that were more readily visible, much like the house was more readily visible. It's very vertical, it's very tall, it's very dramatic, it's very ornate. And on top of it, it sits on a small hill so there's no mistaking its prominence and dominance. But allow me to introduce you to some of the living conditions of a far greater number of people, men, women, and children, who would have been less visible to us over time, any of whom would have seen Oak Street as highly desirable, an aspirational place to live, to own a home and raise a family. One of the most rudimentary forms of housing we repeatedly encounter in the growing list of transient free black communities before the Civil War that we're discovering is a kind of lean-to built into the side of a hill. Let me describe some of them. In the town of Dover, the great historian Benson Lossing's son wrote about the situation in 1880. He said, and I quote, on the Tompkins place lived an old slave in a dirt cellar dug in the side of a hill the cellar was roofed over with logs, holding a sloping roof of earth. The door was of rough boards hung on heavy hinges. He'd worked there as long as anyone could remember. In the town of Milan, the local historian Burton Kuhn wrote in 1909, describing the former enslaved man named Peter Jackson in the 1880s, and I quote, he lived in a hut on Turkey Hill, partly set in the side of a knoll with something like a thatched roof from a local historian in Hyde Park, speaking about the same time, we learn about Solomon Garnett, old Saul, he as he was known, a fugitive slave who lived in Hyde Park over 40 years. And I quote, for a long time, he lived in a rude house built by himself in the pine woods and after in New Guinea, in a rude stone house, half cellar in the side of the hill. This was burned not long before he died and he narrowly escaped from the flames. We also know that some of the more crowded situations of these transient communities like New Guinea, especially along the Creme Elbow Creek, were major sources of death and disease. And so let's look at Oak Street from the perspective of those who saw it, and rightly so, as a place to look up to and aspire to. This photo is from the Museum of Rhinebeck History. It shows at Oak Street Cabin I believe this was at the north end of Oak Street on land owned by a black man and rented out 
to Irish immigrants. And so we look at Oak Street from the perspective who those who saw it from a different perspective from someone living in a space carved into the side of a hill. It reminds us that while one of the most notable things about Oak Street is the preservation of its historic homes, there were likely many much more rudimentary structures for which no evidence remains today. Now onto Oak Street. The story of those of African heritage is the story of men, women, and children first arriving in what is today New York in 1664, enslaved. These are people who, working for two centuries to end the practice, first in New York State in 1827, and then nationally with a guarantee of citizenship and equal protection coming in three consecutive U.S. constitutional amendments that culminated in 1870, which is one of the reasons I chose that year as the end of the period we're examining. In 1820, Dutchess County had a population of just over 46,000. About 5% of the total were persons of color. These persons of color were largely African heritage, but also many mixed race and some indigenous peoples. You can see that between 1790 and 1820, the population of persons of color grew somewhat, and there was a shift to a higher percentage of being free. One little symbol represents 50 persons, either free or enslaved, in green or red, respectively. Property ownership on Oak Street for blacks offered very real advantages. Three in particular are unique to persons of color. The first was the right to vote. As mentioned earlier, the requirement for men to own a certain level of value of property in order to vote started in the 17th century and continued until after the Revolutionary War. But the New York State Constitutional Convention in 1821 ended the requirement for white men, but retained it for black men at a level of $250, free and clear of any mortgage. One of the advantages of property ownership, such as Oak Street, was safety among numbers, because the risk of any free black person being kidnapped and illegally sold into slavery as in 12 Years a Slave, was more common than you might think. On the Poughkeepsie waterfront in 1831, 11-year-old James Goldman of Poughkeepsie was lured onto a boat with the promise of oranges. He was kidnapped and sold into slavery in Kentucky. He managed to escape and tell his story 10 years later. In 1832, a young black Poughkeepsie boy was taken by a white stagecoach owner and operator, Isaac Butler, to Virginia to buy and trade horses with the permission of the boy's father. However, Butler returned without the boy, saying that he'd run away. Investigations led to the return of the boy. Property ownership among a community such as Oak Street also allowed a safe harbor for those who were emancipating themselves. This map from the 19th century shows roots of freedom seekers or the Underground Railroad you can see that Maryland is central. Maryland was one of the states most committed to slavery, and yet it was adjacent to the south of Quaker stronghold Philadelphia, which offered safety and cover. It's interesting that Maryland is so central because we find a good number of persons of color from Maryland in a position to purchase property on Oak Street. We know from recent work on Hyde Park's New Guinea community that a man escaping enslavement from Brazil and another, escaping enslavement from Virginia, chose to settle permanently in that location rather than go to Canada, which does indicate a certain degree of security locally. So that may have also happened on Oak Street. The most likely candidates for those on Oak Street are those who were born in Maryland, and we'll call them out as we go along. The great Rhinebeck-based Methodist leader Freeborn Garrison and his daughter, who gave land for a dedicated burial ground called Section E, for persons of color, it was also from Maryland. Peter and Lydia Johnson bought lot 18 for $40 in 1833. It seems to be the first purchase we can find. The purchase price also shows how out of reach the $250 requirement of property value was for a free black man to gain the right to vote. But she had many years ahead of her. She was emancipated from enslavement by Revolutionary War Colonel Henry Beekman Livingston 15 years early in 1818. 
He was living in Rhinecliff in the house that no longer stands, but there's a state historic marker that marks the site. She shows up in the 1840 census, which is shown here. Among a cluster of so-called free persons of color who were identified in a separate set of columns off to the right that indicate their age, the census was generally taken door to door, so a cluster of people like this indicates they were living close together. This is Oak Street in 1840. It shows 22 free blacks from five family households. Lydia Johnson, as shown here, is over 55 and is living with two children, a boy and a girl. Lydia and Peter Johnson are reported to have had many children. Among the better known was their son, William Johnson. Early in his life, William was a chauffeur, a traditional role for men of color at the time, but he later found great success as a chef and restaurant owner and bought a lot on the east side of Oak Street in 1852. Research by Bruce Dedrick shows that Johnson ran a refreshment saloon at the Poughkeepsie train station during the Civil War. In 1866, he opened a barber shop in Rhinebeck. It only lasted a short time. He really hit his stride with the opening of what newspapers at the time said was, quote, a first-class restaurant in every respect. It was two doors south of Star Institute, which would later be the site of today's Fosters in a building that no longer stands. He was known for his root beer on ice, fine oysters, and clams. He opened an ice cream and confectionery store in Rhinecliff that was highly regarded. Johnson's wife arranged for the import of oranges from Florida. In 1895, he moved his fish, vegetable, and ice cream business to his home on Oak Street. He operated a catering business for the Hudson River steamboats. For a time, he was a chef at what is now the Beekman Arms. He died in his home on Oak Street on January 29, 1913, around the age of 100. In 1835, Lot 22 was purchased by Sally Gilson and her mother, Betty Shermerhorn. Sally Shermerhorn married John Gilson in 1818 at the Rhinebeck Reform Dutch Church. They both worked, but were unsure whether enslaved or free, at Janet Livingston Montgomery's house, which was known as Montgomery Place in Red Hook we quickly lose track of what happens to John. Sally Gilson's tenure in service lasted beyond the life of Janet Montgomery, who died in 1827, and into the lives of subsequent members of the family who lived there. Sally Gilson is buried in Red Hook Methodist Cemetery with her son and daughter, neither of whom married. The headstone is shown here. Sally and John Gilson's son, Alexander Gilson, owned a house close by on the adjacent West Chestnut Street. He owned two properties in Red Hook, a home and a rural lot with a greenhouse. Alexander Gilson was the head gardener at Montgomery Place. He's internationally recognized as a botanist for having created a type of begonia that's double blossoming. The plant, officially called Begonia Gilsoni, is named after him. The property associated with him, although on West Chestnut Street, was part of the 1820s 52-lot subdivision. In the same year that mother and daughter, Shermerhorn and Gilson, bought a lot, a woman from New York City, Sally Lawson, who's described as a woman of color, bought three adjacent lots, 39, 40, and 41, that remain combined today, forming the widest lot on Oak Street. A decade later, she bought an adjacent lot number 38, making a total of four adjacent lots, although she did not hold on to that one for very long. She's buried in Section E of Rhinebeck Cemetery under a headstone that shows her married name. It reads Sally L. for Lawson, wife of James Butler. In her 1857 will, she references a gold watch and chain and a silver cup, which she left to her granddaughter. Her children lived in the house for many years after her death. Sales appear to be quiet until 1843, when Theodore and Margaret Thomas purchased Lot 19. Theodore Thomas was born in Maryland, which is as good a place as any to look at the potential role of Oak Street in the Underground Railroad. Given the scale of slavery in Maryland at the time and its reluctance to abolish it, it's highly likely that the Thomases were born enslaved. The death of their son is significant. His headstone is in Rhinebeck Section E because he died serving in the Civil War, 
And, as you will see, he's not the only son of Oak Street to die in service to his country. Although we know that Dennis and Harriet Savoy were living and raising children on Oak Street by 1840, we saw them in the census, they did not formally purchase land until 1854, when they bought lots 44 and 45, which were described as at the corner of the adjacent West Chestnut Street. You can see the house indicated on an 1858 map at the far north of Oak Street. The story of the Savoys illuminates the classic role in this case of young men of African descent being waiters, as well as the charged and dangerous dynamics of the deadly competitive steamboat business on the Hudson River, with each boat determined to show that it was the fastest. This unusual and extraordinary headstone in section E of Rhinebeck Cemetery is where four Savoy sons are buried. Three died at the same time in 1852. They were all on board the steamboat Reindeer when it exploded. They're buried with a son who had died several years earlier. Whether Thomas or Dennis or Harriet Savoy, who were all born in Maryland, were self-emancipated cannot be determined for sure, but it certainly seems possible. The fact that Theodore Thomas and Dennis Savoy were both waiters and that four of the Savoy sons were waiters on the Hudson River steamboat, suggests that they might have had a hand in helping freedom seekers escape north on the lesser talked about black lead river route of the Underground Railroad. We speak more frequently of the Quaker-oriented Underground Railroad in the middle and eastern part of the county, but we're beginning to learn more about the black lead Underground Railroad along the river, where women of color as chambermaids in hotels young men of color on boats and in the transportation industry were in a strong position to facilitate escape to the north. In 1855, Henry Williams bought lot 35. His wife, Hannah's headstone is visible in section E. Census records suggest that they've had several children and that Henry Williams was a coachman. Blacks continued to own property on Oak Street well into the 20th century, which is an area of study in and of itself. We'll now look at the very distinct schoolhouse to transition into the examination of the arrival of Irish Catholic immigrants. Theodore and Margaret Thomas were involved in selling a portion of the land that would become the Oak Street schoolhouse in 1844. The schoolhouse is distinct from its neighbors for two reasons. It has a very large setback and has unmistakable board and batten Gothic Revival style architecture. Built in 1844, its date of construction coincides with the date of construction of the house built by Henry Delamater on the nearby Montgomery Street, which was designed by the renowned architect Alexander Jackson Davis. The schoolhouse was sold sometime after 1868 to private individuals. In 1870, it was being used by a 29-year-old Irish immigrant as a blacksmith shop. This is a map from 1890. So in the first two decades of settlement, those purchasing property appeared to be all persons of color, several of them women, which was unusual at the time. And the next wave of settlement that we examine, we find are distinctly Irish Catholic. In 1850, the railroad from New York City to Poughkeepsie was completed, and the segment connecting up to Albany was underway. This was the work that drew Irish Catholic immigrants to settle locally. They were distinct, both for being Catholic and being impoverished. It was low-paying, dangerous work, and most lived in shanties along the railroad tracks. Irish immigrants would have been keenly aware of the value of land ownership because of their status as tenant farmers in Ireland, the English landlords in London controlled what was grown, and richer food was being exported to England at a time when the lesser potato crop that was made available to the Irish poor was hit by a years-long blight that resulted in famine and death. This map, showing Oak Street prior to 1850, showed landowners of African descent in orange and the school outlined in gray. Records indicate that the first purchase of land on Oak Street by Irish immigrants was made in 1850 with the purchase of two adjacent lots, followed by a third shortly thereafter, shown in green. We know that a good many Irish immigrant railroad workers 
lived in the most rudimentary of housing and shacks along the railroad tracks. Oak Street, by comparison, would have been a very desirable alternative that was out of reach to many. It's no surprise that the first Catholic church in Rhinebeck St. Joseph's, which is shown here in an older and a contemporary photo, emerged in Rhinecliffe. A carpenter himself, St. Joseph, is the patron saint of the working class and immigrants. One of the specific ways these Irish immigrants were portrayed as untrustworthy and unworthy of rights, like voting or economic advancement, was through the argument that Irish Catholic would be pawns of the Pope in Rome. Critics warned that papal domination of the United States would be achieved in this way if rights and liberties were granted to these immigrants. The Irish-born Daniel Garvey may have been some sort of intermediary with railroad workers, as his name shows up not only in the purchase of the two adjacent lots in 1850, but also subsequently in other purchases and sales on the street. Garvey bought lot 23 and 24, which are shown here. The houses are separated by three feet. Thomas and Bridget Lydon emigrated from Galway, Ireland to the U.S. in 1849. In 1854, they bought lot 31, and in 1856, they bought the south half of the adjoining lot 32, giving them 60 feet of Oak Street frontage, which is the current lot size. They raised six children here, including three sons who volunteered to serve in the Civil War. Martin was born in Ireland in 1846, he enlisted in the 150th New York Volunteers, a Dutchess County Regiment, and was killed in action on July 13, 1864. He's buried in Rome, Georgia. John was born in Ireland in 1851. He enlisted in the 6th New York Cavalry and was involved in battles in the western U.S. He fought in Indian Wars in the Great Plains and through his military service, he earned property in Kansas which he was able to use to his advantage, becoming a wealthy cattle rancher. John Lydon's wealth was attractive to criminals, however, and John was murdered on his ranch in Kansas in 1875 to conceal the theft of his extensive cattle herd. Patrick, the third son, who was born in Ireland in 1840, he enlisted in the 128th New York Volunteers, another Dutchess County Regiment. He died in 1894 in Lincoln, Kansas, after inheriting the ranch that belonged to his brother. What amazing journeys these Leiden family members had, all through Oak Street. June 1, 1875 is a landmark date because it marks the day that Hugh and Ann Mahar bought lots 29 and 30. Hugh Mahar's 1906 obituary in the Rhinebeck Gazette described him as having come from Ireland to Rhinebeck in 1856. He was active with St. Joseph's in Rhinebeck. He was one of the founders of the Church of the Good Shepherd in the village. However, Anne, in particular, became quite well known and visible as a community leader. While she did not hold formal political office, she seems to have been a prominent community leader and successful businesswoman. She ran a hotel and tavern and was occasionally reimbursed for taking care of impoverished homeless persons. When commenting on her death, in June of 1894, the Red Hook Journal describes her as eccentric, but leaving a good deal of property and savings. The next group we examine on Oak Street is the white Protestant working class, or so-called mechanics. The group that decried its status in Dutchess County as 7,000 landless slaves. I mentioned earlier that the political wishes of the mechanics movement involved the elimination of imprisonment for debt which occurred in 1834. As early as 1810, you can see a subdivision of lots on what is today East Market Street and South Street that in advertisements are described as, quote, suitable for mechanics. Land had been established for the great estates and larger farms, but specific property was needed for the burgeoning working class. The first lots on Oak Street that were sold to white Protestant mechanics were lots 44 and 45, the former Savoy lots, they were purchased in 1863 by Stephen, William, and Calvin O'Hara, who lived with their father at a border. The O'Haras, sometimes O'Hara, have roots in 18th century Connecticut and were involved with the Rhinebeck Baptist Church in the 1820s. The O'Hara household includes a tinsmith, a hat maker, and several shoemakers. They received a grocery license 
and a license to sell intoxicating liquors, we can see here in a newspaper clipping from 1873 that the O'Haras received payments of $27 from the village for housing the homeless poor. You can also see that Anne Mahar received $78 for the same service. Towns and villages had elected overseers of the poor who made determinations as to whether someone would qualify, and if they did qualify, where they would be housed. In 1865, the children of Sally Lawson Butler, who first purchased the three adjacent lots, and we believe built this house in 1835, sold the premises to Francis Schwartz, a widowed German immigrant. The house stayed in the family for 87 years, until the buyer's son, John Schwartz, who was an electrician, died there in 1952. So only two families lived there across 117 years. It's unique in that it retains its three standard width lot that was acquired by the original owner. 27 Oak Street also stayed in one family for a long time. Albert Wager was a shoemaker. In 1933, his granddaughter, who was living in the house, found a boot that he had made in 1863. Through marriage, the house was occupied by the Latin family. When U.S. Army Sergeant David Latin was killed in action in France in 1944, there's a long record of service to the United States on Oak Street. One Rhinebeck resident in particular of this class had a meteoric rise. Expanding our lens to adjacent West Market Street, we find the home and story of Nathan Darling. The 1858 map shows, we believe, both his old house just toward the road and the new, much more expansive house that stands today. That is why it looks like there are two houses in 1858. Darling was born into poverty in 1801. He was a house painter, but he differs in that he was a mechanic who was able to leave that life behind. He seems to have navigated the explosion of splintering political parties as he switched from a Democrat to a wide awake Republican by the time of the 1860 presidential election supporting Lincoln. Nathan Darling's sister, Catherine, managed also to emerge from poverty and worked, worked as a bookbinder in New York City. However, his brother, William, never escaped impoverishment and was a lifelong embarrassment to Nathan Darling. Darling's second wife, whom he married much later in life and who was from New York City, testified she did not know who Nathan Darling's parents were and that he did not talk about them. After marrying a local woman named Margaret Ackert and starting a family in Rhinebeck, he moved to New York City with his wife where he was a house painter, as this directory from the Times shows. He's found to have very quickly gotten involved in local politics through the mechanics movement, the political movement of the working class, and a group that published this list of its members and you can see here carpenters, stainers, teachers, chairmakers. Darling's first political appointment was in 1833, when he was appointed to the U.S. Customs House in New York City. But he quickly and vastly improved his station, securing three consecutive military appointments through three consecutive U.S. presidents, including Andrew Jackson and John Tyler. Through this military service, he was given significant land holdings in Louisiana, land that he sold so that he could eventually build the house that stands today as a capstone to an ambitious life. He also received an appointment from President Martin Van Buren of Columbia County. Historians prefer to stick to source material and facts, but it is a fact that there was a rumor at the time. Could there have been a special relationship between Darling and Van Buren that explained his meteoric rise. In extraordinary testimony in a court case relating to Nathan Darling's brother, William, after both had died, Darling's second wife is challenged with a shocking question. Do you know that it was common to report that Nathan Darling was a son of Martin Van Buren? The opposing attorney yelled objection, which the judge sustained, resulting in her answer being suppressed. In 1908, the historian Howard Morse, again in his History of Rhinebeck, referred to Darling as a, quote, protege of Van Buren, which, with this additional knowledge, makes us wonder if this was one of the sources of Darling's advantage.
It seems unlikely, but nevertheless appears to have been a prominent rumor at the time. Again, going back to Morse's history of Rhinebeck, it's interesting that Nathan Darling is reported to have had indigenous peoples as servant. Morse wrote he had one or two Indian servants. The 1850 census shows that Nathan Darling's household included a young woman named Louisa, age 16, who was born in Florida. Her race is identified with an M, which would have meant mulatto, which was used at the time to identify indigenous peoples and mixed race persons. It seems fair to assume that this woman came back with Nathan Darling and that she was of the Seminole. The 1860 census shows a woman from Florida who is exactly 10 years older and whose name is indicated with the initial L. She's shown as black. We frequently find some people being alternately indicated as black and mulatto over the decades. It was a very imprecise label. The woman was living on Oak Street and married to a black man named George Johnson, who was likely a son of Peter and Lydia Johnson. The 1870 census shows the same George Johnson still on Oak Street, but his wife's name is listed as wife. Her age does not quite match, and her birthplace is listed as Alter County. It's not clear what's happening here, but it's emblematic of the challenged face by indigenous peoples to maintain their identity. After his military career in Florida, Darling shifted his focus to important political appointments in civilian life in Washington, D.C., all the while staying active in Rhinebeck, in 1856, he was appointed by a vote of Congress to be doorkeeper of the U.S. House of Representatives. The job itself had perks that allowed the incumbent to appoint others to jobs with perks. And Darling seemed to be the kind of person who was always to be found at the center of conflicts. When U.S. Senator Sumner was caned nearly to death on the U.S. Senate floor, it was Darling who tended to his wounds and care and provided the formal medical report. In 1860, Darling was accused and eventually acquitted of aiding and abetting a black man's escape from Washington, D.C., from enslavement. In 1862, President Lincoln wrote out in his own hand a specific pardon for Nathan Darling, who was accused of being overly aggressive in keeping certain persons out of the Capitol building. So the Nathan Darling House, executed in a very local, very democratic style that's come to be known as Hudson River Bracketed, remains today as testimony to the upward mobility of someone who was born in Rhinebeck in what they saw as embarrassing, impoverished conditions. We wrap up with some comments related to women who own property on Oak Street. We've been meeting some along the way, Betty Shermerhorn, Sally Gilson, Sally Lawson, Anne Mahar, Francis Schwartz, but I want to wrap up the presentation by just pointing out a few distinctions. I'd like to use the image here of Lucretia Coffin Mott, who was a teacher at the Nine Partner Boarding School after being a student in today's Millbrook. And in the background, the image of the Crum Elbow Meeting House, Quaker Meeting House in Hyde Park, as a nod to the many women, which is another topic, another day, many Quaker women from Dutchess County, being such a Quaker stronghold, who were fundamental leaders in the earliest movements of women's equality and suffrage movement. We talked about the 1848 property law, which gave women more rights the same year that the Seneca Falls Convention launched the women's rights movement. It was property ownership that allowed for the breakthrough in 1880 for women to have the first chance to vote in New York State. They argued that they paid property tax, but did not have the right to vote. They called this taxation without representation. And in a small first step as a crack in the door in 1880, women were allowed to vote and to be candidates in local school elections, but school elections only. What I found particularly striking about the women who stepped forward in 1880s as candidates is that more than half of them were daughters of Irish immigrants. As a matter of fact, the first woman in the county to be elected to an office was Nancy Boyd Duncan, the daughter of Irish immigrants in Unionvale. This map shows in very general terms 
the increasing diversity of Oak Street over the decades. Owners who are persons of color in orange, Irish, Catholic, and green, so-called mechanics in gray, women owners can be found in all of these groups. We know from a tragic incident that involved the accidental death of a young boy that children of mixed backgrounds, quote, became fast friends in the words of a parent at the time. Oak Street was not a paradise free from any normal human dynamics and tension, but it had what we feel is a distinct and unique role along its 1,000 foot stretch. Laid out 200 years ago with lots 40 feet wide and up to 200 feet deep that reveal how property, Oak Street property in particular, can be an important step up toward the American dream. A walk down Oak Street today with so many houses intact with some adjustments for contemporary comforts, is a walk down a neighborhood and a neighborhood with character. I think if you walk down the street, you can sense something that the residents sense as well. I hope understanding the stories of those who built the houses there and built their dreams there are both things that we can preserve for future generations. Thank you. This is Oak Street. As part of our civics class, we wanted to get a better understanding of Oak Street and its history. So we went around town and interviewed a few residents that live in Oak Street so that they could answer our questions. And this is considered the bad section of Rhinebeck, so it was the cheapest place to find a house. So this, these three houses, the first three houses on my side of the street were uh, owned by uh, black potters. Uh, and the whole yard was clay, and they used to make pots, but I have no idea what they actually made because I never saw it. Actually, this is a very friendly block. I've never met so many nice people in my entire life since I've been alive and lived in many places. Everyone's really friendly and warm. Uh, what do you know about your own home? I know it, it, it's been around. It's really old. It's been it's. My, that house is, that house has been, has, was built in 1920. It's pretty old, so it looks pretty, so it's pretty, like, it's pretty hectic in there. Uh, how has Oak Street changed? I think, um, it changed because a lot of houses, a lot of, because they're like, I think there's like more houses than there were before. And they're like, they're like more ways to, more ways to, to, and, and this is the bad thing, they're more expensive. How has Rhinebeck changed? I think Rhinebeck changed because, <laughs> sorry. Um, again, like I said, um, there's like more buildings being made and the town. And it really, really, if you think about it, it looks, it looks the older Rhinebeck looks unrecognizable. It looks, it doesn't even look like Rhinebeck. What do you but think the future of Oak Street will look like? Hmm. Again, like I think there's gonna be a lot of I think there's gonna be more schools in the district and more like food places and definitely, definitely more homes. All right. Uh, that's that's it. Uh, thank you. No problem. Do you know the uh, the story of Anne Mahar? She was the owner of a house that served as the uh, place where the poor who could not find housing for themselves or who uh, were in desperate circumstances could be taken care of. Uh, there, was, uh, a, there were a set of officials in Rhinebeck, in the village of Rhinebeck, who were known as the overseers of the poor, and they would commission uh, somebody to take responsibility to house and feed individuals on a, usually on a fairly short-term basis uh, until they could get back on their feet. Um, and Anne Mahar was uh, served as the caretaker of the poor in that kind of situation uh, in a house that I believe is the same house that belongs uh, today to somebody that you interviewed uh, 
also in connection with this uh, history of Oak Street. Michael, Michael Gee and, and his wife. The woman that was the overseer of the poor who ran the homeless shelter, her child who was eight or nine was playing Wild West with one of the other neighboring kids. And I played with toy guns when I was a little. They played with real guns and he ended up shooting and killing the woman who owned my house. And her response at the time was, they were best friends, he feels bad enough, leave it alone. <laughs> uh, do you know like, the reputation of Oak Street Bridge necessarily good or bad? Um, there was systemic prejudice in the village of Rhinebeck against the Oak Street residents, residents for close to 150, maybe 200 years. And I did not know this at the time. And the reason that there was prejudice against it is it was first found by freed blacks long before the Civil War. And they were very productive and industrious and accomplished a lot. Um, then in the 1850s, the Irish fled the, the potato famine and started to come in, and it was a mixture of blacks and Irish. And when I moved there, the last of the next generation that lived there, and there were four families that lived there for probably 50, 75 years, Wagers, Latins, Simmons, and Reifenbergs, and they were all related by marriage. So the whole street was basically their big family turf. And Oak Street had a rough reputation. There were lots and lots of uh, incidents of fights and murders and, and assaults and thefts. And the rest of the people said, oh, that's a rough group, stay away from there. Thank you for watching our video and we hope that you enjoyed learning about Oak Street.